Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdell, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's October 2022, and this is episode 311, which is a conversation about tarot cards. On this episode, I'm joined by Lindsay Medenwald, who is Director of Ministry Operations at Mama Bear Apologetics, and she serves as a consulting editor for the Christian Research Journal. Lindsay has a Master's in Apologetics and Ethics from Denver Seminary. She has a JD from St. Mary's School of Law, and she has a Master's in Public Administration from Midwestern State University. Lindsay has written an online exclusive feature article about tarot cards for the Christian Research Journal, and her article is called Divination and Contemplation, Tarot's Impact on Culture and Christianity. And our subscribers can read her article for free at our website, equip.org. Now, they can read it for free because they have access to all of our exclusive online content, and you can read it for free, too, when you subscribe to the Christian Research Journal, which you can do at equip.org. Lindsay, it's good to have you on again. Hey, Melanie. It's great to be here. Well, tarot cards have had a very long history and, of course, occultic roots, but they really seem to take off in the United States anyway in the 1960s, and probably a lot of our listeners might remember tarot cards as kind of something that was associated with the hippie movement or, you know, you drive down some huge boulevards in large cities and you see those like dingy palm reading stores and those kinds of things. But of course, as I talked to Lindsay last month about witch talk, social media and TikTok has really revived this interest in tarot cards and has made them really popular again. And not just to the general culture, but more specifically to younger generations like Gen Z. So I first want to go all the way back and ask Lindsay to give us a basic history of tarot cards. But before that, what are tarot cards and how long have they been around? That's a fascinating question. I too, Melanie, thought that it was a thing of the new age back in the 60s and 70s. I didn't really know the history at all of tarot before I started this project. I can remember driving through LA a few years ago and being struck by the number of tarot readers that were available on side shops on the road. And I just wondered to myself, do people actually go to tarot readers anymore? And to come to find out, they do. Um, But I always thought, you know, Maybe tarot is super old and it comes from the ancient Egyptians, I think is probably where many people think it comes from, but it's not actually as old as most people think. I was wrong. I didn't know that it would started as early as it did. It actually started in the 15th century, which is just a few hundred years old, which is kind of shocking when you think about it. It's young. And it didn't start as a tool of divination either. It started as just a basic card game. So I play cards sometimes with my family, and it it really did start as a card game in Italy called Taroki. And I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it sounds right uh, when I read it, Taroki. And it was a complicated deck of cards that included four suits like the standard deck of cards we have today with kings and queens and jacks. And then it also had number cards, but it included 22 trump cards that eventually became what's called the major arcana of the tarot deck. And the game itself was complicated. Some have likened it to bridge, and I personally have never figured out how to play bridge, so that doesn't really help me understand the game of Taroki. But essentially, each card was assigned values, and there were four players, each in a partnership, and they were just trying to win the most points. It was popular in Italy. It eventually shifted over to places like France and Switzerland, and then the game tended to just disappear for in favor of there were other games that came about and Taroki sort of just dwindled. 
So it sounded like it started just like a casual card game. Like you said, there were trump suits, almost like a trick takey game or a party game. So when did it become more of what we know now as tarot cards, which is kind of telling your fortune or your future or your romantic prospects, things like that? Sort of a likely story, if I'm being honest, because it was somebody at a party that saw a group of women playing the game Taroki that started to think maybe the tarot cards are related to something else. Uh, it was a Protestant pastor from France named Antoine Court de Gevelin, and he was attending a party in the 1700s. When he saw the tarot cards, he thought that they reminded him of something he'd once heard about called uh, the Book of Troth, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, I could be wrong on that. Um, again, there's so many pronunciations that sometimes I'm, I'm not an expert in other languages, so I, I'm sorry if I mispronounce words. But they found this uh, book that was allegedly written by an ancient Egyptian god, and it was the god of knowledge, and that was called the Book of Troth. And there were images that were described from this ancient text, which I don't think have actually ever been found. So it's just an alleged text. But Antoine thought that the tarot card images that existed at the time reminded him of that text and thought, well, maybe there is a connection in their symbolism between uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics and what's on the tarot deck. That really set the stage for another Frenchman named Jean-Baptiste Alliet. And he, in the tarot, found that there was actually a divine nature associated with the tarot deck. And he published actually a few books about it saying, hey, we can use tarot as a means of divination. And look, it goes all the way back to Egypt. And so we can definitely rely on it for its divine nature. And then in the mid-1800s, we have a former Catholic deacon who became an occultist who claimed that you could actually find universal knowledge and truth in the tarot deck. You could use it for divine purposes. And that, I think, is really when the game of Taroki ended and tarot cards as we know it, as a divine tool of the occult, really was born. That's so interesting that it became an occultic tool through somebody involved in religion from clergy. That's fascinating. I have been stunned, actually, by the number of so-called Christians who have started to talk about the tarot cards. And I was very fascinated by the fact that Catholics and Protestants in particular were drawn into tarot. Well, you know, we I started this podcast by saying that I my image of tarot cards is like very, we talked about 1960s hippies, you know, drug culture kind of a thing that people did back then. And that it's kind of outdated or part of the new age movement, but it's, you know, very passe. But as we talked about last time you were on the podcast, some of these different occultic things have really seen a revival on social media. So what is the popularity of tarot cards right now? I would say tarot cards are very popular, especially when we are looking at Gen Z. We've seen a large number of Gen Z um, people really seeking truth through tarot and other occultic measures. So they're not just using tarot cards necessarily, but tarot has really seen a spike, particularly when we talk about... Um, the COVID quarantine, it provided an opportunity for people to seek spirituality in, in different ways and uh, occultic means like crystals and Ouija boards and also tarot. There are a couple of reasons why I think this might be true, Melanie, and I've tried, been trying to think about 
why young people would be drawn to something like tarot cards. And I think it's partly to do with the fact that they're just really trying to find a way to be spiritual, but not religious. Religion in some ways has received sort of a bad rap. And if you can be spiritual without having to go to church, then why wouldn't you try? I think is some of the way that um, Gen Zers and millennials have approached the topic. And so they found that tarot can be easily accessible. They can use it in their own home and they don't have to actually go to a tarot shop anymore because of social media like TikTok, where you can find tarot readers online who will help you read your cards, sometimes even for free. They won't even charge to do it. And I think it becomes really attractive to a young person who can just access that right on their phones, wherever they are. And we've seen that in the popularity of TikTok um, and particularly the tarot hashtag. We've talked about hashtags before, but essentially it is something that you can follow on TikTok and tag yourself or tag a topic so that you can easily find that topic within all of the posts that exists on TikTok. And tarot, hashtag tarot, has almost 35 billion views. That is a lot of people watching things about tarot. And the other thing about tarot cards is that they're super easily accessible these days. You don't have to go to the occultic shop downtown to find tarot cards. You can buy them in Target. You can buy them on Amazon. You really can buy them anywhere that you buy anything else at this point. And we're even seeing that tarot is celebrated in things like fashion, which I was very surprised by. And I think you follow some fashion. So I don't know if you were surprised by this, but um, Christian Dior actually had a whole fashion line a couple of springs ago about tarot and revolved around tarot. And and it was very popular, apparently. Um, So we know as people viewing this from the outside that tarot is out there, that it's being celebrated by our current culture and that it's not a thing of the past, that it's actually here and now and very, very trendy. You're listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Journal. Lindsay Medenwalt and I are talking about tarot cards, and she's a consulting editor for the journal, and her online exclusive feature article is called Divination and Contemplation, Tarot's Impact on Culture and Christianity. And you don't want to miss out on reading it, but it's an online exclusive. So of course our subscribers can read her article for free at our website, equip.org, because they have access to all of our online exclusive articles. But if you would like to read this article, which is not in the print edition, but only online, and you don't already subscribe, please do so at equip.org for 3350. And we would like to continue to grow our subscriptions. And we think that this is a very important and vital resource for Christians to really be able to be equipped in their faith and in sharing their faith and find out about the latest trends that are challenging Christianity, just like this particular one that's seen a huge resurgence with Gen Z, especially on social media like TikTok. So you don't want to miss out on reading her analysis of the new tarot card trend. But also, we would like you to partner with us. And of course, a subscription would be the best way that we would like to have you partner with us. Or maybe you're a subscriber. You could give it as a gift to a friend or a family member, or particularly the pastors or pastoral staff or church staff at your, the church that you attend. So this is a really great resource for them because they don't always have time to do a deep dive into what's going on with tarot cards, for example. And we have done that work that will be able to equip them when they read the article. Now, the other way that you can really help us out is just continue to just tell friends about this podcast and about the magazine. And of course, we really would appreciate some ratings and reviews because it helps us with the algorithm online and everything is driven by the algorithm on the internet. And so in order for our podcast to be seen or people 
people to know about our website or our magazine, we need help from the algorithm. And you can help us with that by just giving us a short written review at Apple Podcasts. We'd be really grateful if you did that. Or you can just help us out by giving us a tip for all this content that you get on the podcast. You just head on over to equip.org and just click on to Christian Research Journal. Actually, it says journal there. And then Postmodern Realities Podcast. Every single one of our landing pages has a link where you can give us a tip. And thank you for considering about how you can partner with us so that we can continue to bring you this content. So we've kind of talked about the history of tarot cards and also its popularity specifically with the younger set, the Gen Z set, and the people who are just kind of like digital natives that are seeing it on social media. But one thing I want to know is what about the deck itself? So I know there's like pictures on it. Are all tarot decks the same? Is it a standard deck of cards, like a regular playing card set that always has the same suits and those kinds of things? And then is there a particular deck, uh, are there different kinds like or different styles of decks and what seems to be the most popular right now? That is another fascinating story, Melanie. One of the things I love about researching topics like this is the number of rabbit holes that you can fall and find yourself in for days even. And I have a particular interest in secret societies and have always kind of loved reading about them and researching them. And I was excited in some ways to find that there was a secret society behind one of the most popular tarot decks out there. And the secret society was founded by the Freemasons, which has its own sort of secret society feel to it. The Golden Dawn was founded by the Freemasons in the late 1800s. And the difference between the Freemasons and the Golden Dawn is that both men and women were accepted to the Golden Dawn. And they devoted themselves to looking at the occult and studying magic and learning all about paranormal activities. So it kind of makes sense that they were really drawn to the tarot and and that it was interesting to them. I found that there were a couple of popular members of the Golden Dawn who were responsible for tarot, I think, staying in the fray, like still being here. And those two people are Arthur Waite and Aleister Crowley. And Waite believed that the tarot was a path to spiritual enlightenment. And he very much thought that you could not only learn more about yourself and and develop your self-knowledge, but learn more about the spirit world through the tarot deck. And he commissioned another Golden Dawn member, a woman by the name of Pamela Coleman Smith. She was an artist to illustrate the complete tarot deck. At that point, I, the deck was not completely illustrated. She illustrated every single card, all, all 78 of them, and she made them beautiful. And that tarot deck is, is, is the most popular tarot deck even today. Crowley created a deck of his own, but it didn't end up nearly as popular as the one that Smith illustrated. And so we've, we see that this tarot deck that was created in you know their time, which was old for us, I guess, is still ex- in existence today. And it, it's the one that I think we all think of when we think of tarot. For me, when I was thinking of tarot cards before I started this this project was I thought of those bright yellow cards with sort of some cartoony in imagery. And that is, is actually the deck that uh, she illustrated when, when she was commissioned to do so. And it's called the Rider Weight Smith deck. Sometimes it's just called the um, Rider Weight deck and weight gets all the credit for it. And Rider was the publisher, but we like to add the last name Smith for the actual illustrator of the deck. Today, that deck is actually criticized by some people in our culture, and it's been accused of being too white and too Christian, of all things. And so new decks are being created, especially by Gen Z. And they're using some platforms that are 
not novel to them. They might be novel to some people who have not been raised on digital devices, but they're using crowdfunding sites like Kickstarter to convince people to support them to create more diverse tarot decks. And I read one where they were trying to create, I think it was a more queer friendly tarot deck. And they posted their proposal on Kickstarter and they were fully funded at $25,000 within just a few days of posting this crowdfunding request. I think it shows that people are trying to find themselves through tarot and then when that doesn't work or they think that it actually doesn't support who they are, who they identify as, they're going to try to find it in some other way. But now you can find all sorts of decks that are based on the original Rider Waite Smith deck, but that include characters who are not predominantly white. It includes female characters or members of LGBTQ that are represented on the cards. And it sometimes includes colors that are not so in your face and vivid, but more muted. So I would say that the Rider Waite Smith is still the dominant card deck in use. In fact, I read a, a number of books in preparation of this article, and all of them used the Rider Waite deck, even those who were so-called queer and self-identify themselves as queer. They continue to use the Rider Waite deck when they're trying to teach people how to read tarot. So you've talked to us about various different kinds of decks, but how do you choose? Is it just a matter of illustration style like you were talking about? Like what, you know, is something that draws people to, okay, I need this kind of deck or is there something similar? It's just the illustrations that are different. So all the decks are kind of the same, like I was saying, like playing cards or are there specific kinds of cards that are being introduced in these new decks and what exactly is involved in your standard tarot deck? It's all basically the same. You have the same basic tarot deck. It starts with 22 cards of the major arcana. And an arcana is Latin for secrets or mysteries. So you can think of a major arcana as unlocking life's biggest mysteries for you. And it includes something called the Fool card. So these were the original trump cards that existed in the Italian card game Taroki. These are the, these are the cards that have existed since, since that time, since the 15th century. And there are fewer major cards than minor cards. So when a major arcana card is drawn, it's taken very seriously. One thing I read about was that often when we're watching a television show or a film and they show somebody getting a tarot reading, the death card appears. Quite frequently, if you start to think about it, uh, you've seen the death card appear on many TV shows. And some of the books that I've read by some people who've been doing tarot card readings for decades have said that they haven't seen the death card come nearly as frequently as TV makes it seem that the death card appears. And it doesn't necessarily mean that a person will die, which is kind of the vibe you get from um, television. It basically means that something in their life is coming to an end. So maybe you are going to no longer work at the job that you've worked at for X number of years, or maybe your time in a certain community is done and you're going to be moving on to a different community. And so a lot of the readers I found were trying to convince people that the death card wasn't negative, even though it has real negative connotations. I mean, the word is death. And I also found that tarot readers seem to love the full card, which is represented by the number zero. If you're looking at the major arcana, uh, that's how they're numbered. And, and it's got a zero at the top of it. And when you look at the full card, you see a guy typically who is walking along carrying a lightweight bag and doesn't seem to have a care in the world. There's usually a dog that's running along at his legs, uh, kind of nipping at his ankles, and he's about to walk off a cliff. 
and that's why he's called the fool. And he doesn't even notice that he's about to walk off the cliff. And when that card is drawn, it basically means that you've got some new beginnings coming or that you're super inexperienced and you don't know it. And so the readers are trying to tell you, hey, you're not about to fall off a cliff and die, but maybe you should take note and figure out what's wrong, what's coming up and make some good decisions knowing that maybe you're more inexperienced than you thought you were. So that's the major arcana and the biggest life events that you might experience. But then we've got the minor arcana, which makes up the rest of the deck. And these cards are the ones that fill in the space between life's biggest events. They're the four suits that we normally see in a deck of cards. And uh, the way that they are labeled is, is it varies between card decks, but it's usually with um, wands and cups and swords and pentacles. And they are indicative of the different elements that we see in the planets, including earth, air, fire, and water. So that won't be unusual to those who have studied the New Age or have heard some of our recent podcasts about the New Age or read some articles about the New Age. Those elements are frequently used with magic. And, uh, and, and so it's not that surprising to find that those are available on tarot cards as well. And what the minor arcana or the, the, young, the littler cards reveal to the reader and the person being read is potentially their reaction to whatever life's big events are. So if they drew a death card, then the minor arcana cards that exist in their draw would tell them how they're going to react to whatever is coming to an end. It could also reveal their personality. One of the other things that I was really curious about, because I've never actually received a tarot reading, was how that happens and what goes down when you go and visit a psychic or somebody who's using tarot cards to, to tell you what's going to happen in your life. And so what I've learned is that you go and visit the reader and typically they will ask you a little bit about yourself and try to figure out what it is you want to know. It's usually around one particular question or it could be a series of questions or it could just be general knowledge about what you can expect to happen in your life. And based on that, the reader will shuffle the deck, which is a really important process. And during that time, the reader will think about the question and you will think about the question. And when you are comfortable with the reader to draw the cards, you tell them to end the shuffle. I was really fascinated that the shuffle was such an important part of getting a tarot reading. I wasn't expecting that. It's almost described as a meditative process by some of the books that I read. And I, th I thought that was very interesting. And, and like I said, I wasn't expecting the shuffle to be so important. The other aspect of getting a reading is many times they will have you, the client, pull your own cards. And that could be one card that you'll dwell on for you know the whole time, or it could be up to 10 cards that they draw or that you draw that will lead them to an analysis of your life or uh, help you um, sort through whatever questions you might have. And, and so there's a lot of control that comes from the client themselves and not just the person reading the cards. So if we have newer listeners to the podcast or you just kind of skip around and you haven't listened to everything in order, back on episode 305, Lindsay and I talked about witch talk and that they were people who are on TikTok telling people that they can be Christian and they can be witches. So my question is, are there also Christians on social media saying tarot cards are completely fine for Christians to use? And I'm a Christian who does tarot reading, so I will do your reading. Melanie, I have reached a point where I've stopped being surprised by the unfortunate answer to that type of question. 
before I did the Witch Talk article, I was under the assumption that most Christians tried to at least avoid um, any whiffs of the occult. And then we did. We learned about the Christian witches who said that you could worship Jesus and practice magic at the same time. So that leads me to the idea and the question of whether or not Christians could use tarot cards or if there are actually Christians who use tarot cards. And the short answer is yes. But because we know that there are Christian witches, it shouldn't be that surprising then to jump to the conclusion that there are some Christians who use tarot cards. The thing that I was most surprised by, though, is that there are actually Christians who have started to write books about using tarot cards in their prayer lives. I stumbled across a book in the library and ended up buying it for my own collection called The Contemplative Tarot. It's a Christian guide to the cards. And it's written by a woman um, named Brittany Muller. And she talks about how she was raised in a Catholic family. And then she deconstructed and found tarot cards while she was not following Christ. And she wasn't even looking for anything that would lead her to Christ and stumbled upon a, a deck of tarot cards and bought them and started to use them. And she claims that eventually she found herself praying while she was using the tarot cards. So she would draw a card and she would think about what the card was telling her. And that led her to think about what God was telling her. And ultimately, she started going back to church and she has since become a Catholic again. She has reconverted and she is now a Catholic. It's not fine, ultimately, that she's using tarot to participate in her prayer life. But now she is openly encouraging other Christians to join her in this activity to lead them closer to God. So one of the things that she claims that this is okay because she says that it's just like something called Visio Divina, which is an act of prayer that is often used in Eastern Orthodox churches and Catholic churches, and sometimes even in Protestant churches. And essentially what happens is somebody reads some scripture and then they look at a picture. Usually it's a religious picture or icon is sometimes what it's called. And then they pray. And that picture and the reading of scripture helps lead them through their prayer and in closer walk with God. The author of this book claims that she can use the tarot to help her with this spiritual practice. And she says that that's okay because there are Christian images in tarot cards. So when I read that line, I went back and I looked at the tarot deck and I tried to find all of the Christian imagery that she was talking about. And I could tell you that the imagery on tarot cards does look very, something that you would find in a Catholic church or in an Eastern Orthodox church, sort of like pictures of the saints, if that's a good way to draw a parallel. And you also see crosses. There are images of angels. And of course, there's the devil himself. So there are definitely Christian images on the cards. And so she uses that knowledge to then read the cards through a Christian lens. So let me describe what that looks like, because I think the listeners might be a little confused at this point, because I was. How can we read occultic tools to suit our Christian needs? And she has basically reinterpreted the meanings of the cards themselves. And let me give you an example, the fool card. The fool card we talked about, right, Melanie? So we've got this guy who isn't paying, he doesn't have a care in the world, and he's about to walk off a cliff. 
She's got the picture of the fool card. And then under it, she's got 1 Corinthians 3.18, which says, Do not deceive yourselves. If you think that you are wise in this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. Then she says that this image of the fool is a young person who has stripped himself of worldly attachments and is joyfully stepping off the cliff to fall into the abyss of God. That is not the traditional explanation of the fool card. And she then calls this fool a holy fool and asks the reader to reflect on specific questions when they pray. So for the fool card, she says, what's holding you back from submitting fully to God? And how can you take yourself less seriously in life like the fool does? This is problematic. This is problematic for for many reasons. But one of the main reasons that this is problematic is because we should be fully submitting to God, like she says, and we should also let God lead our lives. But why would we need to use an occultic tool to do so? She explains almost kind of in answer to the question that nobody has asked, but will definitely ask when they read her book, that the tarot cards are just 78 little works of art. And that God can reveal himself to us even through secular art. I'm not denying that. I think that God can definitely use any kind of art he wants to use to speak to us. But this is not just secular art. This is occultic art designed with divination in mind. And so when we are using something like the tarot, we are leading ourselves away from Christianity and into the occultic images that are also prevalent on the cards that she doesn't really talk about, things like pentacles and astrological signs. I think if we're trying to avoid the occult, which is what we're supposed to do as Christians, we should probably not use tarot during our prayers. So, of course, this lady is just saying that the Bible does speak to tarot cards and is positive about it. And of course, she's taking scripture completely out of context. But that's, you know, the for the average Christian who's not in the Bible very often, they don't realize that what she's saying is not what that verse is saying. So does the Bible have anything to say specifically about using tarot cards and practicing divination? We won't find the word tarot in scripture, but we definitely find words like witchcraft and sorcery and divination. And we've talked about this on the podcast, and I definitely encourage people to to look back at previous episodes because there is a lot to learn. If we don't take things seriously in scripture, we can definitely fall prey to the wily works of Satan and his minions. And tarot falls under the umbrella of divination and fortune telling. It's using cards as fortune telling. We see this in both the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament. For example, in Manasseh, he's a king of Judah. We learn about him in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, which are both in the Old Testament. And he used witchcraft and divination pretty frequently in his kingdom. He did a lot of other things like child sacrifice, But we do read about his use of sorcery quite often, and he not only used it for himself, he led other people astray from worshiping Yahweh and then worshiping other idols and using sorcery rather than worshiping God. The Lord tried to stop him, tried to tell him, hey, Manasseh, you should really not participate in sorcery and witchcraft. Follow me. And Manasseh ignored him. Eventually, the Lord allowed him to become imprisoned. And it was then where Manasseh humbled himself before the Lord and repented and asked the Lord for forgiveness and turned his kingdom back to Yahweh. We see that reconciliation with the Lord. He realized that what he was doing was not following God. We see this sort of play out in the New Testament as well. Paul talks 
pretty frequently about uh, not following um, sorcerers and magicians. Uh, we see in Galatians 5 that he's telling the Galatians that they should find their freedom in Christ and that they should avoid acts of the flesh, including sorcery, it's it's listed, and that we should instead pursue the fruits of the Spirit, like love and joy and peace and goodness. And what we find time and time again in Scripture is that witchcraft is described as the opposite of goodness, and sorcery and magic are are condemned time and time again. It doesn't take one very long looking in scripture to find where it's condemned, both in the Old and New Testaments. So we just want to be very clear on this podcast that Christians should not now or ever use tarot cards for spiritual formation practices because they are expressly forbidden in scripture. But are there some alternatives that Christians can consider if they want to expand their prayer life. Some of our listeners, Melanie, may have never heard of Visio Divina or using icons in prayer. The Christian Research Journal has actually done an article as recently as 2019, and that article is available online, and it discusses John of Damascus and icons. An icon, in the most simple explanation, is usually a painting and is typically religious in nature. It's considered sacred. So in his article about John of Damascus, the author, Nathan Jacobs, reminds us that this type of worship is not against the second commandment. The second commandment says that we shouldn't have idols in the likeness of anything in heaven on earth or in the waters, and that we absolutely shouldn't worship such images. But John of Damascus wrote that this commandment prohibits the worship of creation, nature, and demons. On the other hand, it is fine to honor people, places, and things. John of Damascus believed that it was possible for creatures to serve as conduits for divine energy and grace. So using icons in this way can help someone who worships God focus more squarely on him and what he has done for us. It's not like tarot in that this is not about self-reflection and self-knowledge. It's about God reflection and God knowledge. We are growing closer to God by knowing him better. So there are probably some of the listeners to this podcast that know people or have family members or know people with kids that are getting involved in tarot cards and use them. So what are some ways that Christians can respond to this, you know, revived trend really with family and friends? Because it's on platforms like TikTok, I can almost assure you that many teenagers have been exposed to tarot or occultic things like tarot. And so parents need to realize that they need to be having these conversations with their kids starting at a younger age. It's not just the Ouija boards of the past that were pulled out at parties. And and we shouldn't have Ouija boards either, by the way. If we have tarot cards at home, or we have Ouija boards at home, I highly encourage people to get rid of them. Don't donate them, but just throw them away. They don't need to be donated for other people to pick up and to be led astray by. If you're a parent, you should be talking to your kids whenever you get the opportunity to talk with them about divination and witchcraft and letting them know that these things are not figments of the imagination, but that people are actually participating in them and that the spiritual realm is real. I think sometimes we we think it's movie magic, but the problem is, is that magic is in the movies. We just saw Hocus Pocus 2 came out and the most recent iteration of Doctor Strange. They had intense magic in them. And yes, Hocus Pocus 2 was intended to be funny, but a lot of the witchcraft in that film is not actually funny. They're sucking the life out of children so that they can live. That's not funny. Dr. Strange had a witch 
who was performing very, very dark magic to get what she wanted. And ultimately, it caused the destruction of many people, including people she loved. I think when we are celebrating those things in our homes or in our culture, we forget how real it is. Scripture takes witchcraft seriously, and we should too. If we have a family member who we know maybe participates in astrology or goes to see a tarot reader or has cards of their own, I would recommend asking questions. It's the easiest way to learn about a person, and it's it's the easiest way to be gentle in your approach is asking simple questions like, oh, I noticed that you have a deck of tarot cards. Why? What do you use them for? What intrigues you about tarot cards? Do you really believe what tarot cards say they are? And don't make any assumptions about what your family member or friends might think about tarot. If you have people in your life who are Christians, who follow witchcraft or use occultic means uh, to deepen their spiritual lives, I think it's important to have a real conversation with them that they are supposed to be set apart from the world and that we find hope and goodness and beauty in in God and the scripture that we have from him, not in a set of cards created by men that are supposed to improve our self-knowledge. I think it's important to remind Christians, all Christians, and I try to remind myself of this as well, that God's word is going to yield truth and hope and righteousness. And when we get wrapped up in anything of the world, that often leads to heartache and destruction. We see it a lot on social media, especially. And we as Christians should choose hope and that hope within us is Christ. And the best way to share Christ is is through truth and letting people know that God's word is true and occultic means are not the way to find it. Well, on a much lighter note than (laughs) occultic cards, I have a fun rapid fire question for Lindsay. Lindsay, it's the fall season. It's October. Do you like to visit pumpkin patches? You know, I used to when my kids were super little, but I'm getting, I'm getting like a hankering as an adult now to go experience a pumpkin patch. And I heard of a really good one not too far away. So we might be going in a couple of weeks. Well, thanks, Lindsay, for being a guest again on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Thanks for having me, Melanie. You've been listening to episode 311 of the Postmodern Realities Podcast brought to you by the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest was Lindsay Medenwalt. She has written an online exclusive feature article about tarot cards, and her article is called Divination and Contemplation, Tarot's Impact on Culture and Christianity. And our subscribers can read her article for free at our website, equip.org. Now, if you would like to be equipped by this very timely and important article and you don't already subscribe, please go to our website, equip.org, and subscribe for $33.50, where when you do so, you will be able to get all the access to our online content that's exclusive, as well as the print issue straight to your door. Stay connected with the Christian Research Institute and all the new content we have coming your way. The best way to do that is to head on over to our website, equip.org. There you will find thousands of free resources right at your fingertips, from articles to video to audio, and it's all for free. You'll find our podcasts hosted there as well as the Bible Answer Man broadcast, which is hosted by CRI President Hank Canegraaff and streams live every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. In addition, you don't want to miss out on subscribing to Hank Unplugged, which is the podcast of Hank Canegraaff. And in that podcast, he has really in-depth, free-flowing, essential Christian conversations with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people. And in addition, he has a new series on his podcast feed called Hank Unplugged Shorts, which Hank goes into the headlines in the mainstream media and refutes a lot of those cultural issues that we have in these short podcast episodes. And there's quite a few of them. You don't want to miss out on them. Now, if you want to find some of this 
at other places where it's all in one place, really subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a great way to get all of our content there, our podcasts there, and different individual questions theologically that people have that Hank answers at our YouTube channel. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't know how to subscribe to YouTube. I don't have a YouTube account. Well, actually, you might just have a YouTube account. If you have a Gmail address, you have a YouTube account. Just log into YouTube with your Gmail address and search for Bible Answer Man channel, and please become one of our subscribers. In addition, if you see that bell icon right there on our front page, please click that. And every time that we have new content, you will receive a notification that new content is up on our channel for you to be able to consume. So thank you so much for the ways in which you partner with the Christian Research Institute. We are grateful for you listening and reading and watching. Mm -hmm.